रेडी टू गो आदित्य ओके सर सो वेरी वॉम वेलकम टू वन वन ऑफ ऑल ऑफ यू आई एम आदित्य कुमार सिंह एसोसिएटेड विद द इंडियन फ्यूचर्स एंड टुडे वी हैव अ वेरी इंटरेस्टिंग टॉपिक टू डिस्कस एंड फॉर टुडेज डिस्कशन आई हैव विथ मी रजा रूमी हु इज अ वेल नोन इन जर्नलिस्ट Uh, a Pakistani journalist, poli- uh, policy specialist, is also the director of Park Center for Independent Media at uh, Ithaca College, uh, New York, and he uh, is also the founding editor of uh, Nador Media. He has written a number of books, such as uh, the Factitious Path, Pakistan's uh, transition to uh, Pakistan's democratic transition, uh, Delhi by Heart, uh, Impressions of a Pakistani Traveler. being pakistani society culture and the arts pakistan has been in the news for almost 2 to 3 years and imran khan has left no opportunity to put pakistan and himself in the limelight be it on the national media or be it in the international media so to discuss about the happenings and the interesting uh, uh, turns uh, in pakistan we'll start the conversation with the very obvious question sir why do we see pakistan uh, getting into turmoil and churn very frequently what are the main reasons according to you sir thank you aditya i think this issue of political instability uh, has uh, you know haunted pakistan right from the very inception uh, especially with the assassination of the first prime minister as you know in 1951 and since then uh, you know we've had uh, uh these cyclical decades of uh, authoritarian rule under military rulers and then you know some kind of a semi democratic semi civilian transition and uh, so it's an up and down but in the recent uh, decade or so i mean that particular older pattern of direct military intervention has disappeared and now what we have is uh, more uh, uh, of military taking a back seat or driving uh, you know the the car from the back seat uh while at the front there are civilian actors and uh, in particular as you can see the turmoil of t- t- today in pakistan is also linked to very uh, to to this particular issue where uh, all the political forces see military as the real power broker as the real power wielder and they want to uh, align themselves with the establishment so that they can uh, come into power and enjoy their time in power so it's unfortunate but i think uh, that is uh, one of the key issues that we are facing uh, uh, which is le- leading to uh, you know this perennial cycle of political instability yes indeed so army is at the center of a lot of things happening in pakistan But so uh, in 2011, the army decided that we, they could neither trust PPP or Noon League, and they had to come up with another front. And they eventually found uh, their uh, person in Imran Khan, and they decided they will pitch him for that, uh, for uh, for uh, the uh, uh, sorry as the third front. And in two, 2018, we saw that uh, the army was somehow able to cobble a government. and imran khan took over the reins of the country and imran khan did uh, also, he also did not miss any opportunity to sing praises of general bajwa and the uh, is importance of pakistan army and the civilian government being on the same page but eventually uh, army uh, as uh, has happened with other civilian leaders dropped imran khan uh, midway so uh, my question is why did imran khan Uh, sorry army leave imran khan midway so yeah i mean you know those uh, the the recent events have been really uh, uh, interesting uh, but you know nothing uh, unusual if you look at pakistan's history so imran khan was as you know as you r- rightly said in 2011 he got a major boost from uh, the pakistan's establishment uh you know that decided that then to fully launch him i mean you know he was already a political player he's and as you know he's really popular you know as a sportsman as a philanthropist as a budding politician before that but you know he could not really make an impact on the political arena he did not have the electoral strength 
that uh, you need to uh, get, get into power or, or, or enjoy power. So from 2011 to 2018, we see these years where Imran Khan mobilizes more and more people. He has backing of the establishment. And ultimately in 2018, with a manipulated election in his favor, he comes into power. And for the first three years, he is like citing this one page. He has the best relations with the army because he's honest, he's not corrupt, and the army uh, uh, values that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then last year, exactly a year ago in October, he um, uh, had a falling out uh, with the military, especially the military chief on the appointment of the uh, DGISI. Now the inter-services intelligence as uh, you know, uh, and, and, in, and in India, it's also watched very closely, is a very powerful arm of the Pakistan military. Although it's uh, notionally, um, it reports to the prime minister, uh, but uh, in effect, uh, it is headed by a serving general. And uh, the, the, the former DGISI was very close to Imran Khan. He had a good working relationship with Imran Khan. Many of Imran Khan's opponents and critics say that Imran Khan was hatching a plan to use, uh, to, to, to make this uh, uh, DGISI continue in office and you know, hound his opponents and then later on appoint him as the army chief. And so, uh, anyway, I mean, I don't know all of that is speculation, honestly. You you never find uh, uh, precise evidence for these things. But anyway, Imran Khan did not want him to uh, to be changed. And the uh, army chief, General Bajwa, who re retires in a week or so, uh, wanted to change him. So they got into a spat. But more importantly, under Imran Khan, because of his populist rhetoric and his worldview, uh, Pakistan's foreign relations had also suffered a lot. You know, Pakistan has these three vital re relationships with the you know, with the U.S., which is a historical uh, relationship between the two militaries and the two governments since the 1950s. As Pakistan, it has been an ally of the U.S. in almost all regional and, and global security projects, whether it's the Cold War, whether it's the War on Terror, whether it's the Afghan First Afghan War, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, so, so the U.S. was not very happy uh, with the with the kind of declarations Imran Khan made. And if you remember that, you know, he was in Russia the day Russia invaded Ukraine. Now that was a pre-planned visit. I'm not saying that Imran Khan deliberately went there, but the point is that it gave this impression to the West, where Pakistan is dependent financially and economically for bailouts, uh, that. Uh, its uh, prime minister was um, kind of defying the line, you know, quote unquote. And then uh, the Chinese were also not very happy because we have this China-Pakistan economic corridor, uh, 50, 60 billion dollar uh, initiative with lots of highways, infrastructure, etc., uh, export processing zones. So that had been stalled. And uh, <clears throat> uh, that had been stalled partly because Pakistan did not have the money to invest uh, and put its part uh, in those uh, joint collaborative projects, but also because the Imran Khan government, when he came into power, started accusing uh, the CPEC projects of corruption. So two of his ministers, you know, uh, one minister directly spoke of corruption in these projects. The other one said, oh, these are the terms are not favorable. So obviously, as you know, uh, the Chinese don't take these things uh, lightly, you know, so they were, there was a strong reaction. General Bajwa had to go himself to China and pacify uh, the Chinese, uh, le le the, uh, you know, authorities. And then the third critical relationship is Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia, Pakistan is dependent on for oil. Uh, it's the largest source of remittances, uh, you know, with millions employed there. And, you know, and also Saudi Arabia is uh, fully in the Western camp. So anything, if you are not on good terms with Saudi Arabia, it means you're not go on, on good terms with the Western world, especially the US. So uh, so the military was also looking at these, uh, and then the the economic handling and Imran Khan's, uh, you know, he was a novice in the uh, in government. He had, uh, I mean, he had some, uh, some experienced ministers, but many of them were first time ministers. You know, it was like a very amateurish style of governance. So all these factors contributed 
And uh, when this split happened between the military and Imran Khan, the opposition jumped in. The opposition uh, coalition parties said, okay, this is the time to strike. So they launched a vote of no confidence because Imran Khan was dependent on, on three or four small groups in the parliament. And one by one, they, they gave up their support, leading to a change in April 22. But Imran Khan cited that whole uh, constitutional process uh, as a US-led foreign conspiracy in which Pakistani actors, especially uh, hinting the military were, were involved. And he even took the dramatic steps of calling, uh, uh, naming the, the army leaders as Mir Jafar and Mir Sadiq. Now, you know, Mir Jafar and Mir is, is, is also an Indian traitor, you know, when the British uh, took over India. Uh, I mean, uh, yeah, they started with Bengal, so, you know, and he collaborated with the, the colonial authorities. So, so, you know, he started this whole narrative and this campaign. And over the last six, seven months, this, these uh, uh, differences and the split has grown wider now. So that's, that's the crisis at the moment. Indeed, sir. So uh, I'll just uh, push on what you mentioned. Uh, after being ousted, we have seen a very different uh, uh, Imran Khan. Uh, the moment he was ousted, uh, he was at the lowest, but he has made a very good comeback. Uh, if we uh, look at his jalsas, he has been doing them for back to back and uh, hundreds and thousands of people have been reaching the, and uh, to the jalsa. And uh, we have seen a very aggressive Imran Khan, particularly when it comes towards army. And uh, he has not spared the, uh, the ministers, particularly uh, uh, Rana Sanawala uh, and even uh, former president uh, Asif Ali Zardari or be it the prime minister, current prime minister. So uh, uh, that is one story. But on the other hand, he is also having back channel talks with the army. He wants an early election, he has been pushing the government, he's trying to corner the government. Uh, the government has somehow uh, uh, give him, uh, given him a strong, uh, rather tough uh, uh, pushback. Uh, of course, the army is backing the government, but why is Imran Khan uh, being so aggressive as well as being so insensitive to the crisis, uh, particularly the economic crisis, which needs a consensus uh, to uh, revive, why is being so uh, insensitive to the situation in Pakistan? Yeah, yeah. A lot of the, his critics uh, say such things, you know. And uh, the the reality is, like any other politician, he feels that you know. Well, partly it has to do with his ego. Uh, you know, he uh, he did not really expect that uh, he would be ousted from power and that the vote of no confidence that was uh, launched in March would become a reality, uh, but it did, you're right. And then uh, obviously, so, so that has hurt him um, uh, very much, uh, I, I guess, at the personal level. But I think also the fact that, you know, right after his ouster, he realized uh, that, you know, this was a good chance for him to relaunch his populist brand of politics. And as you know, many populists in uh, uh, all over the world, whether you look at Bolsonaro, or you look at Erdogan or other other types of Trump in America, they all use these different kind of uh, you know nationalistic uh, uh, fervor uh, to gain support. And so Imran was doing the same thing, you know, uh, no different uh, from uh, these other characters. And you know, he he, he uh, first of all there is a real anti-Americanism in Pakistan. I mean, I wouldn't say that the, that all of Pakistan is anti-American, but a large segments of Pakistanis have been sort of uh, indoctrinated that, you know, the, uh, you, you know, we have, uh, we have one permanent enemy, uh, enemy which is India. <laughs> so uh, everything that goes wrong, wrong or is, is Ross doing or Indians are doing. And, you know, I mean, the, you know the history. I don't have to repeat that. The other is the is a is a transient enemy. Sometimes it emerges, but sometimes it goes down. But that has to do with the asymmetrical power relations between the U.S. and Pakistan. So Pakistan has always been done bidding for the U.S. You know, from Cold War days, as I mentioned earlier. But <laughs> excuse me. It, but especially in the last war on terror for twenty years. 
Pakistanis have suffered a lot. You know, more than 70,000 people are uh, for dead. For a decade, we had to face terrorism of the worst kind. And now it's, you know, and still it's not gone fully. I mean, it, it has been arrested by the military and the uh, law enforcement agencies, but it, it is still looms large uh, there on the Afghan border and uh, other districts of uh, Northwest Pakistan. So, so there's this resentment in Pakistan that, you know, uh, that Pakistan's collaboration and, and partly it has, it has been propagated by the state as, as well. Uh, so Imran Khan played on that anti-American sentiment. He also brought in religion. Now, you know, in South Asia, most of us are of religious bent and, you know, in our households, in our everyday life, we use religious symbols. So, and that's a 20th century history of, of India and Pakistan as well. But in Pakistan, that, that particular, what he, he, one of his associates called, you know, while he was making a speech, so one of his uh, associates uh, said, Sir, uh, zara Islami touch day. It was recorded on camera, you know, a legendary moment where you could see that religion was directly, or, or a religious reference was being directly used for politics. So Imran cites his, his political mobilization as jihad. It's not the kind of jihad that you guys know in India, but it's like, you know, going for democracy, new election and, and, and undoing. And he calls it a fight between good and evil. He's even... Uh, in a speech said that, you know, if if you don't support me, it's akin to shirk. Now, shirk is this uh, Arabic religious Islamic reference to as a major sin where you where you deny the one monotheism that, that there's one God and you bring other gods into into play. Right. So now, you know, of course, he has faced a lot of criticism, but, you know, he's played on all those cards. And the third card he has very effectively played is once again in Pakistan's history, while there's a dominance of the military uh, or the establishment, there's also a popular uh, anti-establishment feeling because of, you know, uh, uh, whether it was Zulfiqar Ali Bhutto, Nawaz Sharif, Mujibur Rahman in, uh, in East Pakistan, now Bangladesh, uh, they all had anti-establishment politics and they were very popular. So Imran also took that line. So these three touches or these three planks of his strategy have made him more popular. There's no question. You know, the bipoles in the last six, seven months have all, uh, he has, his parties won all those polls. His rallies are big, nearly 60 rallies so far. But also one of the other uh, things where he is ahead of every other party is the social media or digital infrastructure that his party uh, operates. And, uh, you know, it's a bit similar, uh, not entirely, but it's a bit similar to the BJP in, in India, which is very good, very scientific in, in its uh, social media in management. Uh, of course, BJP has the edge because it has grassroots organization, you know, over the last so many decades, it has gone to the villages, to small towns and made its party cadres. Imran has yet to do that. But his social media, you know, the WhatsApp universities, as they are known in South Asia, are very, very, uh, you know, vibrant and produce a lot of graduates every day. <laughs> Indeed, sir, he, he is a master when it comes to communication. But the other actor, that is the current PDM government, uh, I think it has failed to communicate to the people its message. Uh, when we look at the economic handling, it hasn't done so far uh, so good, or at least a bare minimum. It hasn't done even the bare minimum. It has changed finance minister. Now we have Isaac Dar back in the scene, uh, who is also being touted as the de facto deputy prime minister. And uh, also when it comes to uh, the handling of flood, uh, the people who have, were suffering and they're still suffering out there. Uh, and uh, <laughs> and as I've heard and read that Nawaz Sharif was not in favor of continuing this government for so long. He, he had the idea that will come in, announce the elections and get back. But the government continued. And uh, it seems that uh, the plan has failed and it has given an edge to Imran Khan. So, so what is happening uh, when it comes to the PDM faction? We know the we have, uh, you have just mentioned about the Imran Khan faction, what he is doing. 
but what is happening about the government how they are planning and what are they thinking to do ahead well i mean you know first of all i think this uh, this is more like their weak uh, communications uh, because in reality uh, the pdm government which came into power pakistan was at a very precarious economic situation uh, when uh, the shahbaz sharif government took uh, uh, office because it was almost on the brink of a default so you had seen what was happening in um, uh, sri lanka uh, you know, those those scenes. Uh, so there was a big real worry in Pakistan that, you know, and especially the establishment that I that, you know, that may not get repeated. And so, uh, you know, the PDM government negotiated successfully a package with the International Monetary Fund. And then, as you uh, as I mentioned earlier, the Chinese stepped in, the Saudis have stepped in, the Qataris have stepped in, the UAE. So they all, uh, you know, they successfully uh, got some transitional uh, funds so, so that Pakistan's balance of payments uh, deficit or the external payment, because it has to repay a lot of loans, it has a lot of liabilities, so they could be uh, paid off. But then came the floods, as you rightly noted, which kind of uh, have uh, pushed Pakistan back, you know, it has, uh, there's been a loss of crops, there's been a loss of, uh, you know, homes, infrastructure, livestock, uh, livelihood. So obviously that's going to impact the, the overall GDP growth rate as well. Uh, but, you know, for that matter, any other, I mean, this government has, uh, has uh, acted like any other government. The real problem with this government is the perception. The perception being that, you know, just before coming into power through the vote of no confidence, these parties had set up this PDM, as you noted, and had been going around the country, attacking the establishment for propping up Imran Khan and ousting them through rigged elections and disqualifying Nawaz Sharif in 2017. Uh, through a really spurious case. And that whole particular, as I told you, that was a very popular thing. The, the PDM was uh, attracting big rallies and, you know, it had become this big anti-establishment force and suddenly they made this deal <laughs> or this pact with the military and came into power. So their public perception went really down. That's when the Sharif's party is in a, is, is in a crisis. A lot of his supporters were uh, backing him because he was taking the stance against the military and challenging them and challenging challenging the generals and suddenly overnight his brother comes into power he is really really uh, you know uh, I wouldn't call the word uh, submissive that's too strong but really pliant uh, you know in his uh, statements you know so one of the steps that him, that Shahbaz Sharif did after after taking office I think within the first few weeks or months was that. Uh, you know, for the promotion of senior civil servants, he made it uh, mandatory that it has to go to the ISI. The ISI has nothing to do with civilian uh, uh, governance or civil service, you know, so people really raise this question. Obviously, I mean, even before the intelligence reports are sought for civil service, but he did this to, sh to show how much he holds the ISI and the military in high uh, high esteem and that he's not like his brother who's anti-establishment or his, or his niece, Mariam Nawaz, who's also anti-establishment. So that perception has really dented their popular politics. And Imran Khan has taken full advantage of that particular dent or what, what we would call the, the loss of le le legitimacy. Yeah. Indeed, sir, Army. Uh, and... You just mentioned, I would just like to question, uh, you've just mentioned that in passing. Yeah, I've heard reports that there is some kind of uh, discomfort within Nawaz family. Uh, the, uh, uh, even the Shahwaz yes. Sharif and uh, Maryam uh, Nawaz, they are not on the same page when it comes to policy matters or uh, the way to deal with army. So what's your take on that, sir? Yeah, so I mean, you know, obviously there are there are different, uh, you know, like a big any big party, there are different groups in the party. One group, which is of course the main group led by Nawaz and his daughter, are very much uh, keen to push the military back into the barracks. Their agenda is as follows: push the military back into the barracks, let civilian constitutional rule uh, take root. And uh, secondly, as you know, Nawaz Sharif also has a different view on foreign policy, especially 
trading with India, relations with India. So although the I have to say that the current army chief, the outgoing army chief, had also turned come around to Nawaz Sharif's uh, worldview. He has been making all these statements about normalizing relations with India, you know, doing trade and regional peace, geoeconomics, all of that. But uh, the other faction in the uh, in the Vasharif's party is says, well, you know, we have to be pragmatic. The military is, is the major power st- stakeholder in Pakistan. We have to work with them. We have to appease them to enjoy power, do development, and then talk of civil supremacy. So that's the kind of Erdogan Turkey model they cite. That Erdogan did not push out the military overnight but he actually first delivered on his promises, did massive infrastructure growth, development, uh, broad pos- prosperity. As you know, in the first uh, uh, you know, decades of Erdogan's rule, the per capita income of Turkey increased three times, threefold, you know, from whatever. Uh, so it became a middle to high income country uh, under his rule and all the education reform and all the other things that he did. So that's the Shabazz Tarif groups, you know, within the party. Now, obviously, uh, that pragmatic group has won because Nawaz Sharif is out of the country because uh, they, they, uh, you know, if they were out of power, they felt that, you know, they would be, become more and more marginalized and more and more irrelevant. And, you know, being in power has its uh, advantages. You get access to development funds. You have more influence for the following election. So I think they made that calculation around that. But it has backfired because, uh, you know, this is the 21st century. This is Pakistan of 2022. It's not 1980s or 1990s, you know. You have digital media and, uh, you know, uh, as a reality where, uh, you know, millions and millions of Pakistanis are on phone, on mobile phones, on smartphones, and uh, and they get the information from there, they get influence, you know, they engage, they have a be- more direct engagement with what is happening in the country than ever before. So all of these factors have, have led to uh, that particular moment that we are faced now. So the differences are there. But they are not as serious as some of the analysts in Pakistan cite where, oh, the party two, three, yeah, it's going to break away in factions. No such thing is happening. It's one big family. And like all Indian-Pakistani joint, big joint families, they have their their phadas and they, they have, have their disagreements. Uh, but at the end of the day, we are a family, you know, that, that kind of, we are all a family, about that for famous Bollywood film. <laughs> so, yeah. Yes, sir. And uh, so you mentioned about the centrality of uh, army and uh, Imran, uh, we are seeing that uh, when it comes to the appointment of uh, army chief and Imran Khan has been a vocal uh, uh, supporter when it comes to uh, appointment of the army chief. Uh, uh, and he also said that he floated two, three ideas. First of all, he said that whoever PDM government appoints uh, won't be uh, a patriotic person. He questioned the patriotism of the incoming army chief. Then he came up with the idea that uh, the government should uh, take into consideration the opposition's point of view. But uh, since he's not even in the National Assembly, I don't know why he himself calls himself an open opposition leader. And now he's uh, instructing uh, the president, Arif Alvi, to appoint the only the senior most uh, as the army chief. So why is he so obsessed with the appointment of army chief? Well, I mean, you know, as we do, you, you know, he knows that uh, even despite his popularity, even if he wins the election, he will not be able to come into power if the military is not with him. So, you know, we have had cases in Pakistan, you know, again, I will go back to Zulfikar Ali Bhutto. That's Pakistan's unfortunate history. Uh, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto, Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, all these people, all these characters, even Benazir Bhutto, they were extremely popular politicians. But, you know, they, uh, when, when the military did not want them, they were out. I mean, Mujib was, uh, Mujib had to, you know, uh, declare... Uh, a sedition or whatever, you know, must, uh, uh, leave Pakistan, create a separate country. 
uh, at his party, you know. And uh, Zulfikar Ali Bhutto went to gallows. Benazir Bhutto was kept out in exile, you know, given power and on at, at on these terrible terms. And then ultimately, you know, that she was killed uh, in, uh, you know, so, so there's a very unfortunate history. And so that's why where Imran's obsession comes into play. And that's the big problem at the moment, which, um, uh, which a lot of, um, you know, people are raising this question, you know, I've seen in India as well, there's, a, you know, these articles and video debates where they're saying Imran Khan is really giving a tough time to the army and he's going to push them back. In Pakistan, some people also think that, but actually none of that is true. What Imran Khan is saying is, intervene on my behalf, stay on my side, my darling, don't leave me. If you leave me, I'm going to defame you and I'm going to call you names until I, and I pressure you. And you know, the advantage that Imran Khan has, unlike all these characters, Bhutto, Mujib, uh, you know, Bhutto to some extent was similar, but you know, mo most of this that, you know, the core constituency that supports Imran Khan, the urban middle class, uh, lower middle class, urban middle class, aspirational middle class, is also the class that is in the military, is also the class that is in the civil service, you know, they, they take go through competitive exams, those who have gotten degrees in the judiciary, in the media. So he has this real powerful, vocal, strong allies in these institutions. That's why he's also getting away with a lot of name calling. If any other politician or activist, especially let's say from Balochistan or Khyber Pakhtunkhwa or Sindh had called, had criticized the military, he or she would have been dealt with, you know, with an iron hand by now. But it's Imran Khan because he has support within these institutions. So it's actually a bit similar uh, to the BJP's support base initially when BJP uh, started becoming popular in, in, in India. All the and I'm drawing these these references so that you can viewers can can better understand Imran Khan and his politics. So, like when BJP started becoming popular, its base it, its 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 major argument, well, one was against dynastic rule. Second was against the corruption of the Gandhi family and the and the Congress stalwarts. You know, and it is identical in in Imran Khan supporter think uh, or I mean most of his supporters think dynastic politics is bad. Uh, people should not have a birthright to come into, uh, uh, you know, power or rule parties or lead parties, you know, like the Gandhi uh, kids are now ruling uh, the Congress or, or other smaller regional dynasties and the corruption. You know, I remember when Manmohan Singh was the prime minister and, you know, we all used to like Manmohan Singh very much. He was a technocrat, Paralekhai, you know, and but there were these mega scandals of corruption by the Congress party, you know, which were amplified by the and very, very successfully used by the BJP to build that particular anti-Congress narrative. Imran Khan is, has a very similar thing. And that's why Imran Khan is a reality. That's why he's gained so much. He has consolidated all that anti-dynastic, uh, you know, uh, political um, mood. Uh, he has consolidated all that anti-corruption, uh, you know, like you have Aam Admi Party, Anna Hazare, BJP, Modi ji, all of them are very vocal about corruption. So Imran has brought them all together under his umbrella. So that's the the kind of um, politics that he's uh, he's he has initiated, and he's also successful. So you mentioned about corruption, and uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, I don't know. Uh, Imran Khan's corruption story have come into the public domain. The Tosh Khana uh, case is one, and he has also been uh, 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 sanctioned or uh, eliminated by the uh, election commission. But why has the why have people of Pakistan uh, ignored, if I may use the term, his corruption stories, and they believe that the opposition parties are more corrupt, or uh, and uh, when it uh, compared to Imran Khan, why is his corruption story not uh, making the headlines uh, there? Yes. So, I mean, there are many reasons. I mean, first of all, see, the thing is taking gifts and selling them in the open, I mean, you know, buying them cheap and selling them in the open market. I mean, it's not illegal. 
Okay, so first thing we need to remember is that this is a lot of opposition attack on him. Of course, what he did was unethical, uh, was distasteful, I would say. It doesn't suit a man of his stature uh, or a prime minister to do that. But it's not illegal. I think that the, the legality issue came in because he did not declare that in his returns or his, uh, you know, before the election commission or whatever. And the case is still now in, in appeal. We'll find out more details. So first of all, is that. And yes, his associates have been in, indulging in corruption. In Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province, where his party has been ruling for almost a decade, there are multiple mega scandals, you know, of corruption, of misuse of public funds. But you see, the thing is that Imran Khan is also a cult. And the cult figures are above, uh, beyond reproach. So Trump in America has done many, many bad things, you know, like putting his son and daughter in the White House, using Trump Hotel, influencing, running the businesses while he was the president. But his followers say, so what? He's great. He'll make America great again. So Imran Khan's core constituency says, well, he is the World Cup winner. He's the builder of this uh, philanthropic hospitals. He's the, he's the clean man. And these minor things are just propaganda. And deep down, again, it goes back to, sadly, to the establishment's policies. So you see, when General Ziaul Haq's martial law ended in 1988, I mean, 85, and Zia died in 88, Pakistan returned to a civilian rule. From 88 to 99, until Musharraf came in, uh, it returned to a civilian, semi-civilian hybrid rule in which the politicians' corruption was made, uh, you know, uh, turned into a big, big propaganda item uh, by the establishment. You know, the, they were constantly filing cases against Benazir Bhutto, her husband, Nawaz Sharif, Nawaz Sharif's family, his associates. And then came General Musharraf. He said, both are corrupt and I'm going to oust them from politics. Imran Khan was an ally of Musharraf. Sorry, I have to go back to the history. So, and Musharraf also amplified that propaganda, you know. So imagine from 1988 to 2008, it is exactly 20 years. It's a whole generation. So in Pakistan now, a whole generation and a half uh, has grown up with these stories of the corruption of Imran, uh, of Imran Khan's opponents. You know, so young kids do not know about the history of Pakistan. And partly it has to do with our textbooks, the way we frame history, where we don't criticize the role of the establishment or their direct takeovers or the you know, loss of democracy. And so that particular indoctrination and all these kids have grown up, they've become Imran Khan supporters. So they know this history that, you know, Benazir Bhutto, Zardari, Nawaz Sharif, his brother, they all are corrupt. And here's the clean alternative. That was also military's point of view until last year. You know, they brought him into power. They, they projected him as this clean persona. So be, faced with this manufacturing of these, uh, these realities or semi-realities, it's not going to be an easy thing. It's going to maybe take uh, more years for people to know more, a better education system, a more informed and informative media. But unfortunately, uh, you know, none of that is in, in sight. So this will continue for some time, yeah. Yes, sir. And uh, <clears throat> apart from the uh, apart from support amongst the middle class and a section of military, he has a considerable support when it comes to Pak judiciary. And we have seen the way Pak uh, Pakistani courts have dealt with his cases. They have been more than cordial and respectful when it comes to uh, dealing with his cases. So why uh, why do we see uh, that uh, in particularly in judiciary where it has to be uh, judging the case on on the merit rather than uh, doing a fan following kind of thing? So I I think uh, I think the judiciary well I mean I think partly it has to do with the fact that people who go into become judges you know people who become lawyers and judges are also you know, barring a few, like, you know, a couple of elite background judges, mostly they are middle class uh, background, you know, the educated professionals, the upper middle class, middle class uh, 
background they go into law they practice law they become rich you know they get appointed to the benches then they go up the high stem so it's the same class that we are dealing with right and they are also divided about this you know this clean hero cult like figure called imran khan versus his uh, uh, stories of uh, gifts and you know little mis- uh, misdemeanors and little uh, corruption stories etc cetera, etc cetera. or even the uh, blatant violation of the constitutional provisions when uh, he dissolved the assembly while he was facing a vote of no confidence you can't do that so supreme court did give a verdict against him i mean it's not that they all are but i think partly it has to do with the fact that the supreme court in pakistan has also emerged as an independent player since the lawyers and judges movement since musharraf's ouster so now earlier they were like uh, second in league with the military if you look at pakistan's history from 1950s onwards whatever the military was doing the judiciary followed but now they have have a, a a greater measure of independence and autonomy i i won't say they are fully independent or they are fully autonomous that's not the case because we saw what happened to nawaz sharif the way he was disqualified in 2017 and the supreme court was was uh, uh, clearly biased against him and wanted to oust him and that was also the military plan and that was also imran khan's plan so it was a happy coincidence of all three but they also read the signals so when establishment is divided when establishment is not on one page on how to deal with imran khan the military also says hmm let's see who actually uh wins in this struggle in this power struggle that's going on in rawalpindi or islamabad and they read the signals on the wall and they don't want to jump and take a side so they will first so now this change is coming you know a new army chief is likely to be appointed in a week's time or less uh, a new doctrine will emerge you know while we had we were living in under bajwa doctrine mm-hmm. that's also interesting in pakistan army chiefs you know these doctrines are usually made by by either politicians or thinkers or intellectuals but in pakistan we we have to accept uh the doctrine set by the big boss uh, in in rawalpindi and uh, everybody uh, you know uh, falls in line i mean uh, Uh, and uh, so uh, so things are now changing and uh, it very much depends on you know the new chief will come in uh, initially i don't think he will make any particular decisions it uh, it takes any chief uh, you know somewhere between 3 to 6 months to consolidate his um, himself as the leader but who whosoever will be the chief the army's institutional interests their world view will dominate you know it will not be driven by imran khan or nawaz sharif or shabash sharif or whoever pakistan army is also pretty autonomous when it comes to its own uh, thinking and its own policy so but i think so it's going to be a transitional time soon of course sir. and last month we uh, heard the news of the unfortunate death of pakistani journalist arshad sharif who was uh, known to be close to Imran Khan and once upon a time close to the establishment and we saw some uh, heard some allegations from Imran Khan accusing them the uh, DGC uh, I think uh, general uh, I forgot Faisal. the name Faisal yeah. uh, Faisal Adeem and uh, later on we saw uh, DGISI coming out and doing a press conference for I and that went beyond an hour Uh, which I is saw, a very uh, uh, unprecedented why do you think that the dg isi himself had to come out and explain the situation uh so uh, look um, you know aditya uh, the thing is that um, i'll uh, explain it to you that you know i don't think imran blamed ashish uh, general faisal for ashish sharif's attack i mean he actually imran khan's party that uh, so first of all i i'll tell you i also knew ashish sharif very well he was a friend and i i was extremely shocked and saddened uh, by his tragic tragic murder in kenya uh you know it is so unfortunate it is so unfortunate but you know uh, uh the moment this news came in imran khan's uh, party on social media directly blamed general bajwa you know it's all on record i mean i'm not making it up it's public record 
and they went started this campaign against Bajwa and against uh, the the ISI, you know, the usual thing, and so that prompted them to come out in the open and kind of defend themselves. And then the attack on Imran Khan happened, and in for that attack, Imran Khan has, other than the Prime Minister and, and the Home Minister. He has named General Faisal, who's the DG, who's number two in the ISI. So, and he wants him to be named in the FIR. <laughs> now, you see, that's also unheard of, unthinkable in Pakistan, uh, because, you know, the ISI uh, has been a holy cow. You know, other politicians are always very, uh, you know, they think 10 times before uh, say naming that. Uh, name, naming any of them rightly or wrongly, but I think I think he's also Imran Khan is also playing politics on that. So he knows that he has to pressurize the establishment. He's trying every trick in the trade to pressurize the establishment so that it again becomes partisan in his side. Okay, come back to my fold and support me and intervene on my behalf. So he wants that. So that is one thing. But Arshad's case is very complicated, and it is very complicated because it was done, as you know, uh, through a, uh, a, a nefarious operation uh, through the notorious Kenyan police. You know, somebody obviously uh, was, and as you know, Nairobi is now also the home of underground mafia of many countries have shifted there. Even I believe some Indian uh, ma- mafia because Modi ji ne unko nikal diya hai, Bombay wagaira se crack down karke, so they've gone to these uh, outside countries, right? I mean, you see a lot of these Bollywood films uh, uh, show these uh, international sort of linkages, uh, but also that is true of other mafia, you know, even from, I remember that when, when Pakistan army did operation in Karachi, a lot of uh, underground mafia moved to South Africa. And before that, Hong Kong used to be a, a, a place. And then China came and cleaned up Hong Kong, you know, uh, were cracked down on that. So Nairobi is this hotbed now of a very corrupt, unaccountable, violent police force, the existence of all these different underground mafia. So I think that, you know, obviously somebody tipped, somebody uh, asked them to strike on Asha Sharif. And the question is who it is. Is it the Pakistani establishment, as Imran Khan and his supporters say? Is it somebody else? Is it a faction? Is it a rogue element of the establishment? So all of these questions are are totally unknown. And so all you have is speculation after speculation after speculation. So the best way, ideal way, which I doubt will happen, is that Pakistani and Kenyan authorities collaborate and find out the truth. And, you know, through a proper process. But chances of that are, are very slim. Indeed, sir. And you mentioned about uh, an attack on the on Imran Khan, which was uh, absolutely unfortunate. Uh, but uh, later, uh, I think a couple of days before that, uh, Faisal Wadwa did a press conference and uh, he had predicted some kind of bloodbath if the uh, mm. long march continues. Uh, uh, in that case, why did Imran Khan proceed with the uh, long march when he had that uh, an idea that something might happen? So why did he do that? And uh, now he has uh, said that he'll be reaching Pindi on 26th. Uh, is he trying to pressurize uh, the Pakistani army to some kind of compromise, to reach some kind of compromise? Um so the thing is that uh, he earlier i think his uh, his uh, ambition was to time this long march arrival in pindi and islamabad with the before the appointment of army chief so that he could uh, pressurize the military and get um, you know uh, an army chief uh, of his uh, or at least influence that decision making uh, but I think that particular strategy has not really worked. Now he has to live live up to his words. So I a lot of observers in Pakistan are saying that you know now it is more of a more of a you know face saving that he has to do because the army chief will be appointed very soon, and uh, that they may be back to. So you know alongside this march, he's also been been in touch with the establishment. He's, he's been having parleys uh, backdoor. With the with General Bajwa, with the ISI, his uh, associates, especially the president of the country, who is who is his party member, 
has been facilitated the, facilitating that dialogue and apparently they may have reached some kind of an understanding now that's all things change in pakistan they are tentative but we'll soon find out indeed sir and uh, so i'll just ask my last question before we end this uh, wonderful session uh, so what is the impact of uh, imran khan's action when it comes to the democratic uh, institutions we have seen that uh, his actions are not actually helping the pakistan uh, democracy so what can be expected in the future and what's on uh, uh, the appointment of army chief what is your take who are the currently who are the uh, front runners there so i mean you know i i do, you know honestly speaking this is such a i mean i mean i'm actually shocked and surprised at pakistan's politicians Imran Khan included, Sharifs included, to make such a big, big hoopla about the appointment of army chief. Honestly speaking, Nawaz Sharif has appointed the most army chiefs. He has not survived in power for three times. You know, despite popular popular support, he's been ousted from power. Uh, Imran Khan gave extension to General Bajwa, who's now the you know the outgoing chief for three years, and. Imran Khan could not survive in office, <laughs> so I really don't think it. What what difference would it make? But it's just you know it's a perception game. It's a it's a perception management. It's that reprieve that politicians think you know always that they might get. So the front runners, you know, General Sahil Sahil Shamshad Mirza is the senior most. Uh, General Asim Munir is the senior most uh, now, and uh, and then he's followed by General Sahil Shamshad Mirza, and then he he's followed by General Azhar Abbas. And so I think it is going to be one of these three uh, as um, uh, as army chiefs, uh, you know. And I believe that you know the sheriffs want General Asim Munir to be appointed as the army chief. He's also the senior most. He's uh, you know he's also most experienced. But also he was DGISI under Imran Khan for a short time, and Imran Khan removed him. So you know there's a political angle there as well. And then that's followed by General Sahir Shamshad Mirza, who's considered to be really, really, I mean, he has no, he hasn't served in these capacities. So he's supposedly a very professional soldier. And so is General Az Azhar Abbas. But, you know, honestly speaking, Aditya, for as a Pakistani or as, a, as, as just a lay observer, I think it makes no difference because the institutional interests, institutional thinking is so clear and dominant in, in, um, the military as a whole, as the that you know, whosoever yes, the chief gives maybe prioritizes certain di di directions. You can see how General Bajwa is not talking of, about geoeconomics, but you know that is also driven by the international and regional factors. So I think the next army chief will also uh, be saying the similar th uh, saying similar things. So it's it's not unique, and um, the 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 only concern I have is that whosoever is the next army chief takes a step back, 10 steps back, and let the politicians, let the parliament do its work, not intervene directly or indirectly into the political affairs. That is how stability will come to Pakistan in the short to long term. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much uh, for your time and valuable insights on the uh, politics and the happenings in Pakistan. It was really great talking to you. And once again, thank you very much on behalf of India Futures. And uh, we hope to have you again on our platform and continue our interaction with you. Yes, I look forward to that. Thank you, Aditya. And thanks, thanks to Dr. Manish also. And not just online, but in person. Indeed, as sir. In Pakistan, indeed, inshallah. Indeed, <laughs> indeed sir. Okay. Thank you so much. Take care. Sir. Take care. Bye.